so you get these influencers, and then how do you get those fast followers? Like, what was the problem for them? Yeah, so, um, so what, and this is sort of where the two-sided network starts to kick in. What, what we talked about is how do we seed one side of the network? How do we solve a problem for one of the sides of the network um, that added value to them long before the other side showed up? And so we, we were able to, to get, you know, of the top 20 restaurants, we might get five or eight or 10 of the, the influencers in a market. You get them to start signing up. The next sort of 50 would all want to be what those top 20 were. So whatever those top 20 were starting to do, they would start to do it. So now we got enough to where there was critical mass on the website, and that's where sort of the two-sided network starts to, to kick in. And uh, who was your first customer? Uh, we had sort of uh, one of uh, four. Uh, we had uh, a, a group out in San Francisco called Real Restaurants where we had Beetle Nut and um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on their, I'll think of their name. And then we had actually two restaurants here in Chicago, um, they were lettuce entertaining restaurants, Papagus and um, why well, John a blank here? Uh, Vong's, Vong Thai Kitchen. So, so two markets at the same yeah. time to start. Yeah. Talk about that decision and how it worked out for you. Uh, not intelligent. Um, no. <laughs> no. So bold. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, so um, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is my father-in-law um, is one of the co-founders of Lettuce Entertain You, and so. That was why my wife was really concerned about the restaurants we got into when he came out to see us. But um, so he helped us. He made introductions to restaurants so we could do it and we could try it out here. Um, and the, frankly, the product was terrible, um, but, but the restaurant sort of got the value proposition out of it. And so they, they were able to work with us. Um, but, you know, those four restaurants we spent, you know, we would come out here and sort of spend... Um, uh, hours sitting in there listening to them take reservations and how they, they did it. And I can remember going to the ESPN zone and sitting in those big chairs with beers at the end of the day because we were just burnt, um, uh, you know, trying to relax. But um, so those were our first four customers, or our first two customers, really. And now obviously there's somebody who was selling something that did this functionality, but they weren't getting penetration in the market. What was different about what you did to get penetration in the market then? Who were the people who were offering something that took reservations that weren't as successful in a way that you were? And what was the, what was the difference maker for, yeah. for your business model? Back, back then, there, there wasn't many other options out there. But the big guys were, you know, Micros and, and those guys were trying to sell a reservation bolt on to their normal point of sale system. But they were selling it in a... Um, sort of client So server. the point of sale system in a restaurant is essentially, you know, I was a bartender in college. It's, you know, we didn't have all this technology then, yeah. but it was, you know, it's, it's, you put in the drink, it sort of gets you portion control, it helps yeah. you look at shrinkage and, and, and that it's, kind of it's stuff, what right? fires the tickets back to the kitchen and, mm -hmm. and that type of stuff so that then the kitchen knows what to cook and, when, you know, when things should come out. And it's actually done a lot for inventory and actually theft reduction because a lot of servers, you know, would not charge for the whole thing or, you know, write up two tickets and customer would pay one. And I mean, but but think other. about this. If, if you went to a venture person, they'd say, well, how are you going to penetrate that market? Because these other guys already have big market share mm -hmm. and they can just bolt it on and sell it. I mean, you know, that would be intuitive to a lot of venture people early on is that you, you're at a disadvantage mm -hmm. and how will you overcome it? Um, obviously you did, but, you know, the conventional wisdom would not have been that this was a good idea. So how would you do it? Um, yeah, so the big thing that we did is we changed the business model. So instead of it being a, an upfront capital cost, um, we, we moved to sort of a software hardware as a service model. So a lot, a lot of these guys may not actually have been around software back in when we didn't sell it as a service. So why don't you give a little feel like what the dollar difference would be? Yeah, so um, a, a restaurant who would buy a reservation system from Micros or someone like that would probably spend 18 grand, something like that up front. It's where we'd come in anywhere between $500 and $1,000 to install it. Then we charged the monthly fee that included product upgrades, customer service, backing up of data, those types of things. And then we charged a dollar per head. For what was your monthly fee like back then? Uh, it was about one. So we started. So we've only raised the prices. We've only changed the prices really once in the in the history of the company. We started off five hundred dollar install, and it's dependent on how many terminals you'd have and other stuff like that. Big restaurants would have multiple terminals. Smaller restaurants might have a single terminal. Terminal. So it's a five hundred dollar upfront. Um, hundred dollars per month, and then a dollar per head, and then it went to about twelve hundred dollars up front, um, to like one ninety eight a month, um, and then dollar per head still. See, a lot of people don't think about the idea of you can you can do this with changing the economic model, and mm -hmm. I think that's really you know it's a really powerful one. 
you know, software as a service is known now, but at the time, that was a, a big departure. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it paid off well. Let's talk a little about two-sided marketplaces, because mm -hmm. a lot of people here, I think, are either entrepreneurs, work in entrepreneurial companies, or have been it. And, you know, if we started our first business, which was inventory management, and we went for the two-sided marketplace model. And we found it very hard, you know, ultimately, we weren't successful in a subscription model. You had both. Um, you know, there's no question that a two-sided marketplace model adds incredible leverage and value mm -hmm. to the business because, uh, you know, the more successful your customers are, the more you make. We have customers who make $10 million from using our software, and we're still making, you know, $500,000 mm -hmm. off them. We, met, you know, we don't get any upside. Mm -hmm. um, you found a way to share in that, but these are hard to do, easy to, easy to want mm -hmm. to do and hard to do. So talk about the secret of how you made that chicken-egg problem work and get solved mm -hmm. in your case. Yeah, so two, two questions there. I think one is, is sort of extracting the right amount of value out of a, of a business. And, and we were able to, and I don't know how we came up with it, but certainly extract the right amount of value out of a business for the amount of value it was giving. And that was, you know, subfront fee. In a, larger restaurants might have three or four systems, and so they'd pay a higher monthly, and they'd get more covers in a particular month online. So, they'd, so you know, a big restaurant might pay $2,000 a month. A smaller restaurant might pay you know, seven hundred dollars a month. So from that from that perspective, it worked really well. But so so two sided networks are hard. They are very hard to do. And and I've seen a lot of companies that on scale the model's beautiful, mm -hmm. but to get to scale is certainly hard. And so um, my so, belief. Well, go came first, chicken or the egg in the, your case. Yeah. So so for us, you know, going back to that sort of going after the top twenty restaurants, getting some of them, then moving the next um, group up into them. So now. We created, you know, and again, they could use the tool for a long time before an internet reservation ever came through the door and it would provide value to them. And so, um, and, and this is sort of back to your last one. So Mike and Matt with Grubhub, they went after the other side of the network first. And so they built a system that if I'm a diner and I want delivery, I can put in my address and it'll show me every restaurant that delivers to me. So now you start to train the diner to come back to you and the diner gets value out of you because one of the big attributes for, um, ordering delivery is, is discovering new places. And so they helped a diner solve one of those big problems by being able to do this. So now you start to get diners coming back and you add you know, more and more restaurants that now deliver you know, through online. And so now they're monetizing more and more of that traffic. So as we, as we got to getting sort of this next 200 or 300 restaurants below sort of the top 70, 80 restaurants, now is when the diner would come to the site and you'd see our conversion numbers, sort of a big S curve that would happen. And if you know, there was one result that came back for a diner search, the chance of them converting was very low. But as they sort of went towards 10, 12, 14 results, the chance of converting was very high. And so once you start to get people converting, you know, it, it's self-reinforcing at that point. But it, it took, it, it, and so every market for us is an individual tipping point. So, you need a certain critical mass, um, and we weren't this sophisticated. Certainly, the, the, the Grubhub guys you know, came a few years after and were much more sophisticated about the level of penetration you needed in a market before you saw that tipping point. How long did it take before you guys really started to see that initially? Yeah, so San Francisco was the first market for it to happen, and it probably took five, six years for wow. the, really to see the... Um, and, and to, Your hybrid model worked well for you then. Yeah, the it did. Because and that was our revenue model. Is you know we would get some revenue along the way for adding value. Eat um, today, feast tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, and it was you know it was it's sort of all the upside now that of the value we're creating, and you create this really strong network that's hard to break out of. Well, once you get into a, a marketplace model, it is. I mean, I, I still remember, you know, the lesson I learned was really simple, which is some of you may remember. Um, when eBay, uh, early in eBay's life, they went down for three days. Now, you know, people were using that as the backbone of their business, and everybody said, they're going to go out of business because other people have platforms, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fourth day came, they went back online, it was kind of up and down, you know, like a power outage, and people came back. And the reason was, once you have that liquidity, mm -hmm. once people, that's where they transact, that's a really powerful... Um, Thing that's hard to actually screw up yeah. and and the leverage you get on it because it just grows and grows without having the same incremental cost is unbelievable yeah. so um, I mean a new restaurant that opens up in Chicago or San Francisco or whatever that, that comes on open table will bring in in the first month four or five six seven hundred reservations wow. or 700 covers and that pays for the system for like two years so there's no competitor out there that can offer that type of um, sort of return on investment yeah that's awesome that's really exciting um, 
So if, as we sort of leave the early days, um, what was the most important lesson, would you say? Um, I think one of the things I, we didn't do well, and I didn't do well uh, at, at OpenTable, was manage uh, the growth to the reality of the market. And it was certainly at a time where there was a lot of um, uh, hysteria about how fast can you grow. You know, the, the, when we were in, in raising a, a $10 million round, one of the investors looked at us and said, well, if that's what you can do with 10, what could you do with 20? And we just, like, we couldn't spend 20. And it was just, and, and, and so you kind of had to be as irrational as your least rational competitor was. Um, and so it, got re, it so was this sort of tension of growing as fast as you can, um, sort of hoping that the revenue would come in, would fill in behind it. And, and so, you know, as I look at, um, now when I work with entrepreneurs and sort of think about it is how do we make sure that the capital structure sort of matches the reality of the business and if you start putting more money into the business and that return's not starting to show up, then you need to figure out how to dial that back down. I was at a meeting today where uh, Linda Dara from UFC was involved with Grubhub and it's, you know, the, the UFC competition and she said, you know, people talk about how these things happen so fast, but those guys started in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the guys from uh, 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 Braintree started in 2007. I mean, these are great successes, but you know, most most successful entrepreneurs are on Instagram, mm -hmm. where you make a billion dollars 18 months later or something. Mm -hmm. And so, that's important because you can't outkick your coverage on it, this. It, it just businesses take a long time before you start to hit that, that you know that rapid growth point.